Oh, it's okay. Um, I'll, I'll continue introducing our speakers then. Um, Professor Sam B B Burton joined the um, leadership of Fraunhofer IKS in the role of research division director, where he steers research strategy into safe intelligence. His own personal research interests include the safety assurance of complex autonomous systems and the safety of machine learning. In addition to his role in within Fraunhofer IKS, he has the role of honorary visiting professor at the University of York, where he supports a number of research activities and interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, let's welcome Professor Sam Burton. Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. So I'll just um, uh, share my screen and then hopefully we can get started. So can you all see my slides? Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation to talk today. It's my pleasure to talk uh, at this uh, workshop. I've been following this workshop very closely. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. So what I want to do in my talk today is, is maybe give a slightly different perspective on the topic of AI safety. This is probably due to my background. I come from like a, a systems engineering and I'm more of a sort of system safety background and I've spent a lot of um, years also in industry working on very practical safety engineering topics. And what I want to talk about today is um, the impact that the increasing complexity in our systems is having on our ability to decide whether or not our systems are really safe enough or even discuss what it means to be safe enough. So I'm going to start off with more of a systems perspective, um, but don't worry, at some point I'll also get to talk uh, about AI and safety um, specifically. However, what I want to do today is present uh, really detailed scientific results. I want to leave that to, to the other presenters and I really want to uh, provide a more of a sort of an overall perspective on the topic. So um, let's start off uh, about looking at autonomous systems, such as automated driving in general. So first of all, if we look at these systems, actually what we find out is they're inherently complex. And by complex, I don't mean that autonomous systems are just difficult to build or consist of very many different parts we need to somehow integrate, but actually they demonstrate um, emergent behavior which is fairly typical of classical complex systems. So this presents us with a lot of difficulties when we're reasoning about safety. So why is that the case? Let's go back a little bit and, and look at how uh, safety is typically considered in the realm of electronic systems for um, vehicles. So we often talk about functional safety as defined by, for example, by the, the standard 26262. So functional safety is typically defined as the absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards called by, caused by malfunctioning behavior of the electronic uh, systems. In other words, something has to be broken. And that could be hardware that breaks over time, but it could also be software that is just designed badly uh, or has some software bugs. It could also be hardware that has some hardware bugs as well. So we've seen this a lot in the past. But in other words, this type of view on safety is really looking at what happens when something is broken. So when we talk about automated driving and autonomous systems in general, there's a number of different things that are changing here. And one of the key things that change, uh, changes is the amount of uncertainty we have in our system and also the uncertainty we have in our safety assurance. So let's start off looking at where this uncertainty comes from. So first of all, we're working in a very uncertain, complex and unpredictable environment, an environment that doesn't let itself be modeled very nicely. Unlike a, a combustion chamber for, for an engine, for example, where we have really accurate models and we can test our software against the models, that's not the case for um, roads in general when we're developing automated vehicles. So we have this very complex environment that we try to measure with a set of sensors. And unfortunately, these sensors are also not perfect. So they have inaccuracies, they have some noise. So we're trying to somehow capture and understand this very complex environment with a set of noisy 
incomplete, half-blind sensors. But never mind, machine learning comes to the rescue. Machine learning is really good at making sense of unstructured, complex um, information. But on the other hand, as we'll see later, and as everybody who's attending this workshop already knows, and that's why we're here, machine learning itself brings uh, with it a set of uncertainties that lead to very unpredictable results. So if we look at all these uncertainties, which can be summarized in, in terms of aleatoric and epistemic uncertainties, these add a, a level of, of difficulty to arguing the safety of the system. And as luck would have it, the industry has already recognized this and we're starting to develop standards in this area. So one of the standards that have been in development for the last few years is um, in the realm of automated driving functions, ISO 21448. And this defines a different type of safety. It's defined, defined safety in terms of um, risks associated with so-called functional insufficiencies. So in other words, there's nothing broken about the system, but the function just isn't good enough to safely deal with certain sets of situations. And these situations could be inherent in the environment, but they could also be caused by foreseeable misuse of the systems. And a lot of the, the accidents we see with automated driving vehicles and the prototypes can also be put down to basically the driver not using the system the way it should be intended. And this uh, standard basically um, it tells us to do two things. First thing it tells us to do is maximize the number of um, so-called triggering events, so situations which could lead to a safety hazard, but we know about upfront and therefore can, we, can, we can react to. So in other words, if we understand that certain um, customers are gonna misuse the system, we have to detect that and somehow take measures to prevent that causing a hazard. The standard also tells us to minimize the number of hazards which we cannot predict or have not yet predicted. The example here is um, from when Volvo started testing their cars in Australia. Um, their car saw a kangaroo for the first time, and this was a huge surprise for the car. And it was also a surprise for the engineers. Uh, after the case, it always it seems to be pretty obvious, but it was something that um, was a so-called unknown triggering event, something that the engineers hadn't thought um, could have an impact on safety. So this provides us with a different view of looking at safety, where safety is less about something breaking, but something just not being good enough or not having considered the right sets of situations. And obviously, a lot of this is to do with the technical aspects I mentioned in the last slide about uncertainty. However, uh, safety, especially safety for automated uh, systems, it's much more than just a technical challenge. And the use case and the case study I've brought with me today is one that's fairly well known. I didn't choose this use case to particularly pick on Uber, but because it's very well documented in the accident reports that the NTSB then provided. So what happened, and for those who aren't aware of this accident, there was um, a test vehicle, an Uber test vehicle, uh, driving around uh, the city of Tampa in Arizona. And there was a, a test driver in the vehicle. And uh, as you can see on this, um, on this picture, what happened is actually um, the vehicle was driving along a dual carriageway. And at a certain point, a pedestrian started to cross the road. And this pedestrian was pushing a bicycle. And actually, the vehicle detected this pedestrian as an object. And it detected the pedestrian about four seconds before impact. Um, and kept detecting the pedestrian, but kept changing its mind um, about what type of object the pedestrian was. Sometimes it detected it as a, as a vehicle, sometimes as a bicycle, sometimes a, as a pedestrian, sometimes as unknown. And each time it changed its mind, it's, it sort of reset the trajectory prediction and therefore had to start from scratch. And obviously by the time it, it changed its mind the last time, there was no more time to actually uh, react to the incident. And unfortunately, the um, the pedestrian was killed by the impact. And it's interesting now to look at what went wrong here. What were the failures in this system? So obviously 
as I mentioned, at the technical level, there were certain failures. This system just technically was not capable of consistently detecting this object in such a way to perform an adequate break-in maneuver. However, as I mentioned, there was a test driver involved. And this test driver at the time of the crash was actually not paying attention, but she was watching um, a show on her mobile phone. And obviously her job was to ensure that the vehicle was doing what it was supposed to be doing. It was a test vehicle after all. So you could see that to a certain extent, a dereliction of her, of her duty. However, the blame doesn't necessarily have to stop there. At the management level, the accident report actually criticized the processes within Uber and pointed out um, inadequate oversight within Uber in terms of making sure that the test drivers were adequately trained, that they were performing their, their duties. But also um, it was highlighted that the actual engineering processes weren't capable of leading to a, to a sufficiently mature technical system. But even then, should this fatal accident should have happened? Depends on your perspective, maybe not, because actually uh, the role of the, of the state of Arizona um, and the regulatory authorities was there to actually protect the safety of um, the roads. So actually the, the state of Arizona um, uh, was shown to actually um, uh, have a failure to regulate the safety of, of these systems on the road. And uh, at the time um, the, the state was in competition with California and wanted to have a more permissive a strategy to encourage investment, etc., but maybe at the expense of, of some of the regulation uh, that was being performed. And what you can see here is no one single aspect here caused the accident or caused the fatality. It was a combination of all these things at once, sort of the, you know, the most unlucky scenario, but also each of these layers influenced the others as well. So if there was a more rigorous um, approach to regulation, maybe Uber would have had different processes. They maybe have um, had better oversight, maybe um, um, had a more mature technical system, et cetera. And this is an example of, of this sort of emergent complexity I mentioned. And um, last year, myself and some of my colleagues from the University of York, including John McDermott, uh, who co-organized this workshop, we were actually asked to perform an investigation about how such complexity can impact the safety of these sort of um, emergent socio-technical systems. And what we were asked to do is look at a number of case studies and try to develop a framework and try to identify some commonalities of the types of things that go wrong and the types of things we need to consider for future systems. So what we did, we looked at this, not just from a purely technical perspective, but also from the perspectives of governance and regulation, management and operation processes, as well as sort of um, human machine interaction. And as I mentioned, we analyzed a number of case studies in total, it was over 30. And we tried to identify some common factors um, that were influencing the safety in these, in these systems. And that allowed us to, to basically, in combination with our safety training, come up with a framework for reasoning about the impact of complexity on safety. And really, this framework can be summarized as, as follows. First of all, we have to consider what factors actually cause complexity in the system. And we identified a set of keywords that helped us um, to reason about these, these factors at these different levels of governance, maintenance, uh, governance, management, and technical. And then we thought about, okay, what would the consequences of this complexity be in the system? So how can the complexity lead the system into a potentially hazardous state? And how can that lead to systemic failures of the system? So in other words, failures that can't be pinned down to one particular failure of a single component, but require a combination of conditions to occur that otherwise could not be predicted up front. So this allowed us to reason about um, the sensitivity of a system to these different um, types of complexity. The next step was to think about, well, how can we improve the safety of such systems? And we looked at current design controls that are currently in use, and we started to categorize those in terms of trying to 
minimize the negative impact of complexity on the system. And what became very obvious, complexity will always be there to, to a certain extent. So there's always going to be some residual risk associated with complexity in the system that we can't eliminate up front. By very definition, it's an emergent behavior. So we have to consider operation time controls. So in other words, um, measures we can take during operation to try to prevent um, these sort of complex system states lead into a hazard and minimize uh, their, their impact as well. And this is one of the big changes we see with autonomous systems. The shift has got to be from going towards design time controls much more to try and to, to impact and continuously um, reduce uh, um, uh, these sort of emergent behaviors in the field and to try to detect them as early as possible so that we can react accordingly. What we also saw that there were a number of exacerbating factors which actually made this process much more difficult. So in other words, um, there were, could be factors that make it harder to apply design time controls or factors that reduce um, reduce the, the effectiveness of these operation time controls. And on the next slide, um, basically, I, I have some examples here, and uh, I'm sure I can share these slides afterwards so you can read in detail. Um, but also, um, if you want to look at how we applied this framework to this example, we've just published a paper in IEEE Computer. Um, that you can read up and you can see some more details. What you can see in this slide are some of the keywords we used to perform this type of analysis. So um, we were looking at, the, at the, the level of governance, the impact of a lag between technological change and the regulatory frameworks, or com maybe competing objectives. Maybe there were different regulatory systems in place that sometimes can be in, in conflict with each other. Yeah, which could lead to an inadequate um, approach to regulation. At the technical level, we have some of the things I already mentioned regarding the unpredictable behavior of the environment, um, some of the human machine interaction aspects such as automation complexity, um, which can lead to this sort of uncertainty and in the end lead to a mismatch both in terms of the model that the system has about its environment but also uh, a mismatch between um, the model which users or, and operators of the system have about the behavior of the system and the system itself. And, and both these um, factors played a role in the, the tempo uh, crash. And what you can see here in blue were the design time and operation time controls, which ended up being ineffective. So typically when we talk about safety, we We'll talk about safety processes, maybe we'll have some redundant technical systems, et cetera. But actually these were ineffective at preventing these causes of complexity uh, leading to a system that was basically inherently unsafe. So this is a post hoc, a post -hoc analysis we applied, but also you can imagine applying this type of analysis to future systems to try to improve the resilience of future systems. So that brings me to my first um, area of research, which we need to focus on as a community, which is we need to somehow embrace this complexity and include this complexity in our systems engineering processes. So we are aware of how emergent complexity can actually disrupt our systems and disrupt our, our safety um, concepts as well. One of the things that makes it so difficult is the difficulty in actually specifying these types of systems. So how do you specify behavior which you cannot predict up front? Well, you can't typically. Um, and what we uh, refer to um, in, in our work is um, something called the semantic gap. So in other words, um, if we look at previous approaches to, to safety engineering, we'd be asking questions like, what happens if a component breaks? What happens if my resistor blows out? In future, we need to ask the questions, well, what impact will the system have on the overall risk of a, different, of a given operational do domain? When we talk about overall risk, it could be including a lot of these sort of emergent, um, uh, uh, emergent um, properties I've already mentioned. And it could be risk in terms of maybe um, indirect uh, risk where 
you know, we have some knock-on effects of, of increased traffic congestion and things like that. So we end up with a gap between social expectations on our systems and the ability of the systems engineers to actually define what it means for the system to be safe. And this is something we call the semantic gap because it's a, a gap in meaning between these two, two poles. And this semantic gap can be caused by a number of topics. First is the complexity and unpredictability of the domain itself. In other words, um, we as pedestrians behave fairly chaotically and uh, sometimes um, um, maybe do something completely um, unpredictable. But the system itself is getting so complex that there may be behavior in the system we cannot predict and kind of understand. And actually, if we think about adding machine learning techniques to the system, this often makes this um, topic even, even more extreme. And lastly, also very importantly, actually with autonomous systems, we're actually transferring a decision function to the system. So in other words, we're transferring um, the decision-making competencies to the system. And these were decisions that are, in the past, we as humans would have performed, not just based on a purely mechanical specification, but based on a certain ethical legal context as well, which would be interpreting at the same time. And this context is not something that the technical systems have. So these gaps can lead to these sort of gaps um, in the moral responsibility attribution, the legal accountability, and eventually then also gaps in our actual assurance cases and assurance processes. So it should become obvious that actually to close these gaps uh, is gonna take more than just a few good technical engineers. We have to consider these systems from a wide range of perspectives and have to take much more of a multidisciplinary interdisciplinary approach. This includes um, aligning social expectations on the systems, including um, non-technical experts in the design and regulation of the systems, um, trying to speed up the rate of um, standardization and having standards that really help focus on, on what it means to be safe rather than how to, how to be safe, because that's gonna um, become outdated very quickly. Um, and also having systems that are inherently resilient to some of those sort of chaotic uh, events that happen in the environment. One of the things um, that's important to consider here, this is not something we can do in a big bang approach. This is gonna have to be something that sort of takes place iteratively as we increase the scope of the, of the operation domain of a system, increasing the complexity of the interactions, et cetera. And in the end, we need to take a, an approach where we sort of somehow how marry these sort of engineering informed uh, ethical debates where, you know, we're not just having sort of um, high level ethical debates, but debates based on effectively the capabilities, technical capabilities of the system. And we also as engineers need to somehow embrace some of these uh, questions as well. So to give you a perspective on what's happening in the standardization, um, uh, um, community at the moment, if we look at the topic of safety acceptance, um, how are the standards addressing this at the moment? Well, um, I would say politely, they're not quite there yet. So if we look at the standard ISO two, uh, TR4804, which is a standard I worked on myself um, about um, assurance safety for automated driving systems, they define this topic of safe enough in two ways. The first way is um, so-called positive risk balance. In other words, um, the system has to be at least as safe as previous systems in use. So in other words, we have to be able to demonstrate that there's less accidents with an automated driving system than with human drivers. However, the problem here is, what's the definition of an average human driver? Is it even appropriate to compare a, a, an automated system with human drivers? Should it not be orders of magnitude better? Because Unlike human drivers with maybe five sensors, an automated driving vehicle has 40, has much better reaction times. Maybe that comparison also isn't fair. What about systematic failures, which on average may happen fairly um, seldom, but actually if um, each time I um, face a certain type of pedestrian, and I 
hit that pedestrian, that's also not going to be accepted. However, rarely that pedestrian um, uh, comes across the car. And more importantly, how do we actually measure uh, these types of criteria before we actually put the um, vehicle into use? So the alternative to this is so-called avoidance of unreasonable risk, which is all about qualitative arguments, trying to argue that the system has been designed correctly, the process is being used uh, um, effective, et cetera. The behavior that's been designed is inherently safe. But again, here there's lots of open questions, including, okay, what, what does state of the art mean for these types of systems? We don't have any state of the art yet. And, how do I define a safe, proactive behavior? And in the end, I still need some engineering judgment to say, well, the system is still safe enough. So we're in a, a sort of a bit of a, uh, a position here where we find it very difficult to define how safe these systems are. And we'll see how this relates to machine learning um, now. So in other words, uh, as my second um, set of research challenges I wanted to present was actually, we need to come up with a set of qualitative and quantitative acceptance criteria, what does it mean for these systems to be safe? And in the end, it's gonna boil down to a combination of different criteria. We need to apply in comparison, some of it uh, statistical based, some of it more sort of qualitative argument based, and uh, come up with some sort of consensus that these acceptance criteria are um, an acceptable way of measuring the safety of these types of systems. So we're at an AI safety conference. I need to spend some time talking about AI, I guess. So let's uh, uh, move forward with the difficulties of arguing um, uh, the safety of machine learning. As I say, I'm probably not gonna tell you guys too much new here in the space of 20 minutes that I have left. I'm not gonna be able to give any deep uh, theoretical insight onto this topic, but I want to give you just uh, uh, an idea of, of my way of thinking about this. So as we know, and there's no free lunch uh, with AI. Yeah, we introduce AI and machine learning to make sense of this, you know, this complex set of inputs we have to deal with, um, but at the expense of increased um, uncertainty and complexity in the system and difficulties in assuring the safety of the system. And a lot of this comes down to some, some of the attributes I mentioned already. So in other words, um, the difficulty of actually specifying safe behavior. Well, we use machine learning to avoid the need for a good specification or detailed specification, but what's that mean for defining safe behavior? And the uncertainty we have inherent in, in the softmax scores, et cetera, don't help either. And the explainability that's often lacking, lacking all of these things turn into a, a safety engineer's nightmare. Um, and when I started work, working on this topic and looking at, you know, I was trying to work out how well, how good are uh, how good are machine learning functions uh, uh, really uh, um, from a safety engineer's perspective? Well, there were a lot of benchmarks and some of the benchmarks you guys know, things like uh, precision um, and recall and probably I uh, also don't need to explain to you why precision and recall alone aren't really sufficient for, for safety. If we look at the picture here on the right, we have a very high level of precision. Um, which uh, doesn't help this poor guy here on the on the right with the beard because he hasn't been detected at all. Even though the precision is 100%, this metric tells us um, nothing about um, the number of um, pedestrians that are missed. Also, a recall, it seems to help here, at least for detecting, uh, measuring how many pedestrians we miss. Um, but let's say, you know, let's get even more ambitious. Instead of 50% here, like in this example, let's say 90%, we achieve 90% recall. Um, well, this could mean that uh, one in 10 pedestrians are never detected. Now, which obviously would be a bad thing, you know, if I hit 10% of the pedestrians, but it could also mean that for each pedestrian, one in 10 frames where this pedestrian appears are detected incorrectly, but the other nine frames are directed, uh, um, detected correctly. And that might be okay. So they don't really tell us much about, uh, about safety. And this is my maybe somewhat subjective opinion on this topic, um, but the current benchmarks we have, the performance we achieve for ML-based perception is still many, many orders of magnitude away from the type of accident statistics uh, we're trying to achieve. So actually 
going from 87% to 90% for a, any given metric isn't going to solve the problem. Yeah, it's, it's, we're still orders of magnitude away of being what is um, typically considered safe. And if we think back to this Uber Temper um, accident, we can think about, well, what performance benchmarks could have helped us in this accident? How could we have measured that this system is, was good enough? And how good should the object classifier have been to be able to consistently detect this pedestrian in such a way that the, um, that the planning part of the vehicle, uh, the trajectory prediction, et cetera, could have behaved safely? And these are sort of questions that I don't see answered by a lot of the metrics we currently use to measure the performance of machine learning. And so we still have that sort of semantic gap here. So what's happening? Well, we have the start of some regulations and guidelines. So here I've, I've listed the uh, summary of the ethics guidelines from the EU about the use of AI, and they sort of define certain characteristics that AI should have to be trustworthy. That's a really good start, but still we're left with the question of how do we turn that into something tangible and technical we can measure? So how do we, based on these sort of very high level sort of ethical uh, attributes, how do we turn those into measurable criteria for trustworthy AI? And how do we come up with a process for actually ensuring those criteria are met? And this is, there's still this sort of gap going on here. And that leads to the last main part of my presentation I want to talk about is, is, is um, really, uh, this all brings me to my motivation that for AI um, safety, we need holistic arguments. We need to take uh, a broader view, not just look at individual metrics and individual measures, but look at the system as a whole and um, how we can structure an argument that the, the AI components um, are, are good enough for their safety context. So the first thing we need to start off is defining a set of um, acceptance criteria. And one thing I would note is it's going to be a number of acceptance criteria. Let's think back to the pedestrian detection use case. Um, on the one hand, we want to detect every pedestrian that is in our field of view, so we can uh, adjust our, our driving um, um, uh, trajectory appropriately, which means we need to make sure there's um, uh, a small number of um, false negatives. On the other hand, we don't want to be performing emergency braking maneuvers all the time, which means we want to avoid um, too many false positives. So, and these sort of criteria are often sort of almost in conflict with each other when we're looking at optimizing our system. But we need to find a way of, of um, expressing a combination of, of these criteria we apply. And we need to think about what level of performance is required. And this is something, as I, I say, this is not something we'll probably be able to do on our own as, as engineers. We need to take a, a wider perspective, maybe an interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary perspective and look at it from a systems um, perspective. And what I've shown here on this slide is, is one example of an acceptance criteria we could define for a perception function, where uh, the bits in, in gray here are sort of parameters we would need to adjust um, in some way. So we could, formulate the, the statement, each pedestrian within a critical range, within maybe 50 meters of the vehicle, is correctly detected with a certain true positive rate. Um, that's good enough to be able to confirm the position within any sequences of images in which the pedestrian fulfills certain sets of assumptions. So in other words, what we're saying here is for each individual pedestrian, we want to be able to detect that pedestrian well enough that the system can react. And what it means to be well enough detected is going to de depend very much on the surrounding system, on uh, break-in time, on maybe redundant sensor systems, on some monitors and plausibility checks, etc. But we need to find a way of formulating these sort of questions. Once we've done that, that's the sort of the keystone to our safety argument. And next thing we do, we have to ask the question, well, have we achieved this acceptance criteria? Can we measure the, the, the amount of times that we don't fulfill, uh, fulfill this criteria? In other words, the failure rate. And there's different approaches we can apply here. And one of the things we've looked at within Fraunhofer is the impact of uncertainty. 
on um, skewing um, uh, the performance measurements. So we, we introduced this idea of remaining error rate and remaining accuracy rate, which considers uncertainty in the calculations. And there we, we need to ask ourselves, how accurate and representative are these performance predictions we're performing? So what is the sample space we're using to measure the performance? Am I selecting just 10 pictures from random or have I got a, a, a really good representative um, uh, coverage of, of all different types of pedestrians in my test set? Kind of extrapolate from that sample set to make statements in general about how I'm going to behave in all, all scenarios. So that's measuring um, how good we are. From a safety perspective, we often like to res uh, reflect about, okay, well, what are the causes of failures? And do I understand these causes of failures? If we go back to the slide I had about the um, functional insufficiencies, do I know where these failures occur and what causes these failures? And there's different things we can do there um, to, to measure these types of profit properties. And this is where a lot of the active research is taking place, looking at things like um, advers adversarial examples, measuring things like adversarial frequency, uh, looking at things like occlusion sensitivity, so how much of a pedestrian needs to be covered up before it can no longer be detected, uncertainty quantification, et cetera. And this maybe allow us to, to have a better understanding of where the failures lie and, and what causes the failure. So if I have a 90% a 90, 90 um, level of performance, do I understand why those 10% of images aren't being detected? properly. And is there a correlation then to my overall performance rate? So can I use this information to argue that actually the performance measurements I've, I've taken are somehow plausible, that I haven't missed, missed certain start, um, portions of the sample set or, or whatever? Can I back up um, uh, the, the, the measurements I performed there with some sort of uh, explanation or rationale? And if I know where these weaknesses lay, then I can obviously take measures um, to minimize their impact on my machine learning function. So this is where the topics come in, such as um, applying certain uh, criteria to my training data, um, uh, looking at um, the impact of things like uh, ensemble diversity, trying to improve the performance of the system or minimize the impact of these sort of known insufficiencies. And that gives us another, basically, part of our argument. So in other words, by now, what we've done is we've understood roughly uh, what level of performance we've achieved. We've understood some of the causes of um, our poor performance. We've um, come up with a set of measures that hopefully compensate for those insufficiencies and improve our performance. But again, it, we're not going to be perfect. So in the end, we need to come up with a set of measures we apply during operation time to try to minimize the residual failures. These could be things like out of distribution detection, monitor sensor fusion, et cetera. And here we need to ask the question, well, how good are these measures? How effective are they at detecting the type of failures that I know I have in my machine learning function? And can they turn these failures into safe conditions by flagging up um, a set of uncertainty um, uh, thresholds that I need to sort of fall back to alternatives or whatever. And hopefully what I've done there is explain that each of these elements can't be considered in, in isolation. They need to be considered in, in combination and in an iterative approach. So I need to keep repeating uh, this um, until I have a good understanding of what is the real residual failure rate in my system what type of failures I have, how effective are my measures at reducing those fa uh, failures, and for the failures that are left over, how effective are my, my sort of other system measures, my monitors, my plausibility checks, my redundant systems, et cetera. And it could be that as a result of that, we find out that actually the required level of performance isn't achieved, or we don't have sufficient evidence or good argument that we've achieved it. In which case we need to go back again one more cycle and maybe uh, redefine 
what our expectations are on the machine learning function and maybe shift some of the functionality elsewhere or some of the um, expectations elsewhere in the system. So this this has to be a very sort of iterative approach. So this, to summarize, this is the sort of the last research perspective we want to uh, define. Um, we need to come up with a meaningful set of safety metrics and methods for AI and be able to use them in combination. And to do that, we need to understand exactly what property is it that I'm measuring? How does this property relate to the safety of the overall system? And what other conditions need to hold that I can actually trust this measurement and for this measurement to really be effective? And that's why we need this holistic approach and iterative approach. In the end, we'll only be able to do this from a domain specific uh, perspective as well. So, you know, we'll have to come up with a, maybe a different set of metrics and, and a different uh, combination of arguments for different types of functionalities. This is something we're gonna have to do for every, every function. Again, standardization isn't uh, keeping still here. Um, here, a quick advert for, for some of the work I'm doing. So we noticed that the standardization um, in the area of automated driving and AI safety was somewhat fragmented. So I've just kicked off a new standard within um, the ISO um, uh, committees, uh, looking specifically at how to um, define evidence um, for safety for artificial intelligence when being used for road vehicle uh, functions. And this should build the bridge between some of the more generic safety um, standards for AI and the automotive specific safety standards. And hopefully this work will kick off in September. So uh, at the end of my talk, um, just to summarize uh, my main points, um, if we look at autonomous uh, systems, especially AI-based autonomous systems, uh, they're reaching a, a, a type of complexity where um, I find this quote from Arthur C. Clarke very appropriate, where he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So somehow they just work or they just don't work, but we don't really understand how. What's this mean for uh, safety engineering? Well, first of all, we need to somehow acknowledge system complexity. We need to acknowledge this complexity is there and adapt our processes to somehow um, embrace this complexity and uh, be aware of the impact of complexity on our systems. And to do that, we also need to take uh, more interdisciplinary approaches because not all of the questions we face will be able to answer from our technical perspective. Secondly, we need to apply systems engineering approaches. That means looking at the system as a whole, breaking the system down systematically into a set of individual criteria on its constituent parts, and then coming up with good strategies for arguing that the um, individual components beat their, their safety design criteria. If we look at AI specifically, I like to say we need to take the magic out of AI. And for me, this means that Instead of just thinking about uh, typical benchmarks, we need to think about, okay, what do we really expect from the AI function? What level of performance do we really need? And also, will we ever be able to meet this level of performance? Are we barking up the wrong tree? Uh, you know, as, Are we gonna hit a, an asymptote with deep neural networks where we'll reach a certain level of performance and not get any further? And how effective are our current methods of collecting evidence? And um, to solve these questions, we're gonna to need to take a, a structured but iterative approach um, uh, that's informed by typical approaches to looking at safety from a systems perspective, but is um, underlined by a deep understanding of the limitations of the AI methods and the theoretical limitations of AI methods and, and how these types of insufficiencies can, can come about. And, um, as part of that, some of the future work we're looking at is how to formalize some of these criteria so we can actually have a formal approach to combining different measures and metrics when we're creating a safety argument. So that's the end of my talk. I'm sorry, I've tried to keep it uh, short and uh, have some time for questions. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions otherwise later in, a, in one of the panel sessions, maybe. Thank you so much, Professor Burton.
Um, I see some of, some of the uh, participants are already raising their hand. So Great. maybe in terms of the sequence, uh, Leon, do you want to raise your question first? Yes, thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation. So I, I have lots of questions, but I only want to remark now that I'm in the JTC 21 mm -hmm. uh, standardization committee from the Netherlands. I'm also the representatives of the Netherlands of that. And in that uh, working group, I'm leading the working group on augmented goal specification, mm -hmm. which is basically trying to, <laughs> to close the semantic gap mm -hmm. and also looking at more advanced uh, system engineering like uh, self-assessment and self-management, goal orientation and hybrid systems. So. Very interesting. Yeah. So uh, maybe you can send me a, a quick mail yes. offline because one of the things we're doing in the standardization committees, we're trying to find out yes. where all the, where all the uh, interface points are because the standardization yes. committees, as you know, always come from a very uh, <laughs> tight perspective. I will perspective. send you a lot of stuff. So I didn't work on system engineering on these very complex systems and on augmented goal specification. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm also aware of time, so maybe um, Jose, do you want to quickly state your question? And also keep your questions sh short, please. Okay, I'll try to be short. Um, well, great talk. Um, my question is around this, this, this big question about how safe is safe enough. And uh, sometimes we have this, this balance between uh, if the system is not better than humans for every single case, which so is a superset, yeah. of the safety operation of a human, then we don't want it. Or it's more like an average assumption. But uh, perhaps I think that the, the example of a car is, is interesting because I'm more used to some other um, domains where you can allow for uh, uh, semi-automation. And your example about four seconds, four seconds, there's not much that you can do. You cannot really just uh, uh, alert the driver and say, mm -hmm. okay, take the wheel, there's something exactly. strange here. So is that the main reason that perhaps uncertainty uh, estimation, which I think is mm -hmm. a key thing here, because you say it is not our goal to uh, what level of performance we need, but what level of uncertainty estimation we need. That, yeah. that, that's probably the goal of deep learning, deep learning uh, guys and uh, rather than performance. But the question is in a, in a scenario such as this, how is it, is it to implement a kind of an answer, uncertainty estimation that, oh, you should stop the car, but there's no time. For that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, it's it's very difficult, which is great news because I'm a researcher and it's going to keep keep me in business. But it's um, uh, your your observation is absolutely correct about the averaged out statistics. Um, that doesn't help the individual individual pedestrian. Um, so actually, what we want to know is for each individual pedestrian, what is the uncertainty associated with with each pedestrian? And if we can reduce that, maybe you can apply other system measures. And it's exactly the same problem we have with uh, metrics such as mean average precision in machine learning. That doesn't tell me anything as a safety engineer, so, you know, 90% or 80%, that's, I mean, that's still seven orders of magnitude worse than I actually need to achieve. But actually, if, if for each pedestrian, I have a certain amount of uncertainty, which my system can cope with, maybe that's perfectly acceptable. And um, that's why we need to, think about these things up front before we start designing the system, before we start testing the systems. And, and you know, it's, it's the, the problem we have is that these metrics and are going to be very function specific. So actually, one of the things that I want to look at in, in the next uh, year or so is how do we develop a methodology for generally deriving the right set of safety criteria? That we can then apply to different systems, whether it's automotive or, or other systems as well. But this this problem of the sort of averaged out statistics uh, that's um, that really doesn't help us because it's not going to be acceptable if if for a particular class of situations we always fail, however rare those situations are. And you know that's uh, that's that sort of moral dilemma dilemma we're in. Um, and that's why I think at the moment, often we're just asking the wrong questions or measuring the wrong properties. Okay, thank thanks.
if anybody has any other questions, as I say, I, yeah. I think I'll be available in one of the panel sessions, but you can also send me an email. Sure. Uh, Marisha, do you prefer to raise Yeah, I have uh, one more question. Hopefully, you can take. Thanks, uh, Simon, for uh, yeah, good, Marisha, good to see you again. Uh, good to see you. Uh, you know, it sounds like, you, you know, all the things you're proposing are really the right things to do. Uh, I'm just, you know, uh, coming from industry, right? There's this impatience mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, when, whether, when, you know, whether doing all the right things are going to get us there you know, within the next, uh, I don't know, 10 years or, mm -hmm. uh, so what's your take on, on this, this urgency of yep. getting there fast? And, and do you have any ideas of, you know, where we could actually, where are opportunities to accelerate, you know, these mm -hmm. developments? So, um, I mean, if I've been following automated driving for a number of years. I used to work at Bosch on this topic. And if you look at the hype curve, for automated driving and machine learning. Uh, we all know exactly where we are, <laughs> which is pretty much in, in the trough. And actually in the past, if you look at other technologies, actually now, now is where the hard work starts. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's, it's a long, hard climb and real work rather than just some demos you slap together, you know, to Im Im uh, Im um, uh, impress investors. I think the key to this, and this is something that industry doesn't like to hear, or certain certain parts of the industry doesn't like to hear because of the impatience, we have to maybe start on small restricted systems. So we restricted domain with certain uh, amount of compensation through other system approaches, and then actually bootstrap this holistic approach yeah. to doing that. And one of the interesting things is we've been doing, uh, as well as in the automotive area, also work in the industry, automation area, and also rail domain. One of the things that's interesting is if you look at the rail domain and driverless uh, drain, trains, that actually there are already driverless trains on the rails, as it were. And um, that might give us a, a context where uh, we can have very well understood um, stretches of, of track where we, we understand what are the conditions that can appear there, uh, what it looks like typically when there's no obstacles, etc. And that's a good example for a restricted environment where we can sort of help try to bootstrap these, these approaches and then maybe move, move outwards. But it's, it's, as I say, for, for industry, it's, it's not a nice thing to hear. But, you know, time has already shown us, you know, we were supposed to have automated driving vehicles on the road year or two ago and we haven't got that so actually um i think you know a certain amount of patience needs to be kept but we need a systematic approach to getting out of this the value of tears in the hype cycle thanks yep. thank you so much professor burton um You're welcome. so now we'll move on to our paper presentations then um today